All right. Good morning. Or good afternoon. Whenever you're watching this, my name is Madison Walker, and today we're going to talk about phytogenic compounds and their effect on the reproductive traits of ruminants. Okay. So it's kind of the age old question here. What came first, the chicken or the egg? And that's kind of how I think about the repro and nutrition side of things. And so a lot of nutritionists, especially, you know, in this class, we have a lot of ruminant nutritionists and a lot of those guys focus on this left image here where we've got a bunch of feeder calves and how can we make them the most efficient to gain the best, marble the best and do all that kind of stuff. And so a lot of research in this field focuses heavily on those types of animals. But we know in order for us to get to the image here on the left, we've got to start with this calf here in the middle. And he doesn't hit the ground unless she, this cow that's here in the background, gets pregnant. And so the nutrition of this cow is vitally important in order to have these steers here to even worry about trying to feed. And so here on the right, uh, I'm going to show a little video real quick. This is just about probably about a 90 day pregnancy, but you can see, you know, there's the beginnings of what's eventually going to end up over here. And so I don't really think it's that productive to argue about which one is more important or which one came first. But at the end of the day, reproduction is central to livestock production as a whole. And without new animals every year, then there's no way we will have animals to even try to feed. So uh, what are phytogenic compounds? So it's just kind of like uh, probiotics. It's kind of a big buzzword and it has like a lot of broad meanings and there's no real specific definition that's nailed down. But broadly speaking, anything that's plant derived and bioactive can be called a phytogenic compound. So that covers everything from your essential oils to your spices to a variety of herbal extracts. Uh, you can, a lot of different things. Um, some things that they have in common is most of these are going to be aromatic compounds. So brings to mind a lot of different smells that you may think of when cooking or at other times. Um, many of them are like ancient, you would say like herbal remedies or Eastern medicine, things a lot of older cultures used either as treatments or as we talked about before, a lot of spices are used as a preservation technique in foods. Um, and many of these compounds have antimicrobial, antioxidative, and vasodilation type properties. Uh, this is mostly due to the phenolic ring that gives them their aroma. It's also the active component. Some of the more common ones that have been studied for use in animals, uh, ginger, you've got uh, rosemary extract, oregano, um, a couple of different essential oils. You've got your monoterpenes uh, like camphor. That's kind of the active compound in big. So all these things kind of have a similar effect. And then you, your vasodilators are things like capsaicin, which is in your peppers. Uh, anything that's spicy has got that in there. Um, and so in generally, broadly speaking, that's what those are. So moving over to nutritional impacts of phytogenics. So there's quite a bit of research on th this, uh, especially like I said, in the feeder calf, um, you know, you know, the people will say this improves gut health. Well, what is gut health? We've had that debate already. Um, I don't really know, but what they're, what they're saying is they've shown that it increases uh, endogenous enzyme secretion in the host. So they showed this in rats and in broilers. So it's like your amylase, uh, it's a couple of your different proteases. Uh, their increased secretion helps the animal not only digest more of their food and reduce like indigestion and things like that, but that helps improve feed efficiency. They're getting more nutrients out of the same amount of feed. So it's, it's pretty straightforward that we know that these kinds of things improve feed efficiency. Um, in ruminants, it's kind of assumed that a lot of that's due to the antimicrobial effect. Uh, you know, we know that antibiotics improve feed efficiency. We don't necessarily know why. And a lot of these compounds have antimicrobial properties and can kind of be substituted for antibiotics, especially now with, you know, the push toward antibiotic resistance and stopping to prophylactically feed antibiotics. Uh, the other benefit of including these in a ration is that it increases uh, shelf life of the ration. So most of the time, the rot that we see in a feed that causes animals to refuse uh, eating is due to oxidation. And the antioxidant properties of these help increase the time that we can leave that feed mixed or store that feed without having to undergo those negative Im impacts of oxidation. 
But what I really want to talk about today is kind of like more the reproductive side. So we know how this impacts the, the animal nutritionally. And we want to know if we're going to cause any negative impacts or if we may be able to cause some positive impacts from a repro standpoint. Because steers aren't the only class of cattle. We've got other types of cows that we need to feed, and we also want them to be more efficient. So kind of taking a little bit of a offshoot here, we want to talk a little bit about assisted reproductive technology. So a lot of times when we do repro work, we're going to start here in the in vitro side before we go in vivo. And one of the recent technologies that has been developed is known as in vitro fertilization, which essentially is you're picking oocytes from the female, you're fertilizing them in a lab and developing the embryo and then implanting them into another recipient animal. So without getting too much into the details, that's kind of what we're talking about here. Um, this is, of course, an image from humans because it's a much better image on the left. Uh, they make it very palatable to people to see so that they'll do it, right? It's very expensive in humans, but not so much in animals. And then on the right is just your bovine embryo uh, stages of development. Um, so day one is what it would look like when we pick the oocyte up. And then after we fertilize it and develop it for about seven days, we want to see blastocysts that we're going to be implanting in the recipient cow. Um, so this is, I think, the future of kind of where reproductive technologies are going. AI is great and it's cost effective, but I think you can make even more genetic progress even quicker using IVF. But there's still massive room for improvement. Our fertility rates are really low, usually average around 40%, depending on the lab. And then after freezing, you're only getting about 60% pregnancy. So you're much less efficient than uh, in vivo produced embryos, conventional flush, or just natural service or just AI. Um, so there's a lot of room for improvement in this. And I think that's where a lot of these phytogenic compounds have started to show uh, promise. And then that kind of will follow that up with some of the in vivo trials. So this is just a general summary of the effects of these feed additives that they have on the male. We see improved fertility, improved sperm function, improved spermatogenesis, testicular morphology, and testosterone levels. And then in the female, uh, Again, improved fertility, we've got improved pregnancy cons consequences, ovarian development, um, improved granulosa cell function, and nutrient transport to the fetus. So we'll go into this in a little more detail, but these are just kind of some overview slides here. So again, from the in vitro side, we've seen a lot of interesting things with these compounds. So green tea extract was added to a semen extender of boars, and it was shown to improve in vitro fertility and motility of sperm. So one of the biggest issues, uh, even in just regular AI, is you collect a, an animal and they have really, really low mot mot motility, and then after freezing, the sperm are no longer viable. So, you know, green tea is not expensive. This extract is not expensive, and the concentrations they added it in was very low. And so that's just a promising step that really has no downside. Um, it's kind of interesting. Um, this compound quercitrin is also a phytogenic um, and it improved mor morula and blastocyst formation. This was in the rat. Um, most of the time we use the rat as a model for you know the bovine because they're very similar. Um, but basically morula is one of the is the stage before blastocyst. And like I said, blastocyst is the stage we want when we implant that embryo into our recip cow. So improving the number of oocytes that not only get fertilized, but then develop to a blastocyst stage is a, a vast improvement over the 40% that we have now. Um, Olifera improved growth and maturation of sheep embryos. So this is just kind of like saying the same thing that they did in the rat. They showed it in the sheep. But what was very interesting was they did some transcriptome analysis in this study, and they showed that it mod modulated the fertility-related genes uh, in a positive manner. In other words, they're improving fertility generationally. So they're modulating genes related to uh, reproductive tract development, uh, hormone production, and onset of cyclicity to create ewe lambs that will cycle sooner and have a greater chance of becoming pregnant uh, in the herd. And so that's, that's one of the most exciting things because we, we haven't been able to do something like that until now. Like a lot of our fetal programming stuff has a sex effect, has a gender effect but we haven't been able to see where we can improve fertility in utero. And this is, I mean, a, a pre-utero. I mean, we're improving fertility in vitro and that's like, that's just wild to me. So I think that 
that's a pretty cool study. And I'd be interested to see some follow-ups. It was pretty recently done. Um, so obviously they haven't done anything in vivo where they've demonstrated that the fertility really is improved. But from a transcriptome standpoint, it looks like it will be. So like I said, we start in vitro and then we follow up in vivo. So they've gone and added a lot of these phytogenic compounds to the diet and seen pretty much the same things, obviously at higher concentrations because of digestibility and absorption, but they added ginger extract and increased testosterone production in boars. This is largely uh, assumed to be due to the antioxidant effects because we know oxidative stress has a negative impact on androgen production. So the antioxidant uh, effect allowed the boar to produce his maximum amount of testosterone that he was going to produce. Um, Olifera, again, also showed uh, an antioxidant capability. So they dosed uh, dairy cows, and then they also did a study with ewes with this extract, and they found that it increased the antioxidant capacity of the blood. Um, this is in, important because it increases uh, hormone production and more regular cyclicity in both cows and ewes. Um, especially when it comes to ewes, like the next study is going to show with goats, uh, a lot of small ruminants are polyesterous seasonal breeders. And so having shorter, more regular cycles is even more important than it is in cattle. Um, and so we've seen that yucca also increased fertility, caused shorter cycles and increased the kidding rate of goats. Of course, uh, we're not really worried about the calving rate in cows. We usually have singles. If we're going to have twins, it's probably not a good thing. But in goats, having triplets or more often twins than singles is really good for overall productivity. Um, some other interesting things, uh, we know endometritis is one of the leading causes of subfertility and infertility, especially in the dairy herd in the United States. And there are a couple of phytogenic compounds listed here that have been shown to be an effective treatment after three days of intrauterine infusion. And then uh, the vasodilation effects also decrease heat stress. Heat stress has a number of negative impacts, both to the male and the female, uh, semen quality, semen production and uh, also silent heat, uh, you know, early embryo mortality. There's a, a lot of problems with heat stress. And if we can reduce that just by something adding in the diet, uh, it's very interesting. So you may wonder, oh, this sounds like all upside, no downside. Well, there are a few cautions to think about when we're feeding phytogenic compounds. Uh, the number one is phytoestrogens. So probably you may have heard of this in kind of human stuff and People, people like to talk about estrogen in their food from implants, but they don't really ever think about all the plants that they eat. Uh, one of the highest, a comp, one of the highest plants, one of the plants with the highest amount of phytoestrogens is actually soybeans. And so it's actually a pretty common component in many of our diets. So we just need to watch out for how many soybean meal and how much soybean we have in the diet to prevent over consumption of phytoestrogens. These can obviously cause issues with the hormonal secretion of the animal, reduced cyclicity. Um, isoflavones are pretty much the same. Uh, they're found in alfalfa, but they pretty much do the same thing. Um, and so these are just things to be mindful of. In most cases, it's not gonna be a problem, but if we go to the extreme and start adding a bunch of these different compounds, it can build up quickly and cause some negative reproductive impacts. Of course, like toxicity is something to wonder about. So I know personally, like from camphor, uh, the concentration at which it's toxic to the microbes and it shows like a lot of antimicrobial activity is also very near to the toxicity level of the animal. So we want to be aware that while in vitro, we may find that these compounds are helpful. We also don't want to be negatively impacting animal performance or even cause mortality by overfeeding that. And then of course, uh, at the end of the day, we're producing a meat product and we want to avoid anything that's going to produce an off flavor in the meat product. So a lot of these compounds are fat soluble, which means if they, and they're pretty strong in aroma, so they're going to have a flavor. So if you feed too much of this kind of stuff, it will be in the fat of the animal when it's killed, people will cook it and be able to taste it. And for some things, maybe that's not so bad if you're feeding rosemary or something like that, but there are other phytogenic compounds that humans typically do not enjoy. That could be a negative um, from a meat production standpoint. That's all I have for today. Uh, thanks for listening. I know it was a lot of content and probably went a little over time, but I hope you enjoyed.